so this is a topic I could talk about for a very long time, so I'm going to try to not do that um, and try to keep it brief. But if you have questions, please let me know, and I'm happy to address them. Um, there we go. Um, so this is, uh, these are the things I'm hoping to cover today, uh, all briefly. I'm going to talk about the prevalence of uh, late-life depression, um, uh, talk about medical morbidity in older depressed people, as well as some of the differences in uh, depression presentation in late life as compared to with younger adults, uh, a bit about diagnosis, and then treatment, including options for psychotherapy, pharmacotherapy, and briefly about electroconvulsive therapy. Um, ooh, fancy. Um, so this is an old study, but this is kind of what we all reference um, when discussing the prevalence of depression in late life. Um, this is a community sample um, from a study done by Dan Blazer. <coughs> uh, and it shows, uh, as you can see, that depressive symptoms are quite common in late life, at 27% in total in this sample. Um, however, the diagnosis of clinical major depression is, is not, um, and is estimated at only sample, which is about a quarter of that in um, a community sample of younger adults. Uh, the prevalence of depression uh, in older adults also differs depending upon the setting we're looking at, though. Um, that's for a community sample. This is when we get into different medical settings. Um, so in primary care, um, you can see that the incidence of, uh, or the prevalence of major depression uh, increases to 8% and is um, increasingly prevalent in inpatient settings and uh, in nursing homes. So uh, in older people in particular, this is true. Depression and medical problems are frequently comorbid, and uh, this causal pathway may really be bidirectional between medical problems and depression. Uh, and this has been proven to be the case in uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, osteoporosis, and even hip fracture, to name a few. Um, we also know that people who are uh, depressed in late life just have a lot more medical morbidity. Uh, they have more medical illnesses than non-depressed older people. Uh, in one study, uh, they had a mean of 7.9 medical diagnoses compared to only three in those who were not depressed. They have impaired social and physical functioning compared to those who are not depressed. Uh, they have an increased perception of poor health, which ends up leading to more resource utilization in the medical community, including more physician visits, uh, greater medication use, more prescriptions per person, uh, increased emergency department visits, and outpatient charges. Um, and one study even showed that the, uh, given every other medical comorbidity um, and other risk factors for uh, odds of death, depression increased the odds of death significantly. So how does late life depression differ from depression in a younger adult? Well, these are a few kind of common features that do differentiate the presentation of depression in older adults a bit from those who are younger. Uh, older adults are more likely to have distinct psychomotor features when they're depressed, meaning uh, they're more likely to talk and move slowly or even have a sort of physical agitation about their presentation. Uh, they're also more likely to not complain so much of feeling sad uh, and more likely to have a somatic focus to their presentation, uh, meaning they more likely to complain of sort of uh, vague pain, um, ga abdominal or gastrointestinal symptoms, uh, and not so much endorse just feeling sad or depressed. Uh, they're also more likely to have cognitive impairment to accompany their uh, depression, um, makes some sense. We do know that uh, cognitive impairment in the setting of depression uh, does and can improve when the depression is treated. We also know that uh, cognitive impairment presenting with depression in older adults is also a risk factor for the development of later Alzheimer's disease, so that's an important flag to look out for. Um, psychotic features are much more common in late life depression than in depression in younger adults. Uh, they actually occur in 20 to 45 percent of hospitalized uh, elderly depressed patients and 3.6 of community dwelling uh, elderly depressed, um, which is quite significant. In younger adults, this is a rather rare presentation of major depressive disorder. Uh, and the psychotic features that occur um, kind of 
kind of follow these clusters, it's interesting. The more I see older adults who are depressed, the more this becomes true. Delusions are far more common than hallucinations. And these delusions are um, tend to cluster, and research supports this, in a few different areas um, that are good to keep an eye out for. Um, one is uh, uh, guilt, um, delusional guilt. And this is often taking the form of some long since forgotten trivial event from their past that becomes newly significant. A good example would be like a one-time infidelity um, in their marriage that has long since been forgiven by their spouse and that's now um, suddenly some huge issue that they're being held accountable for or their uh, partner's going to leave them over when in reality that's not true at all. Uh, another common uh, delusional cluster is a somatic delusion um, which can often take the form of some sort of abdominal symptom that in their mind uh, is the uh, sign of some incurable disease that they've been, um, uh, that they've come down with. Uh, and then uh, the third other cluster is a nihilistic delusion, um, which is sort of a delusion around death or nothingness. Um, and this, I've actually never seen this in a younger person. I've seen it several times in older people where they actually have the delusion that they are in fact dead. Um, so that's a very ill, depressed older person. Showing any psychotic features, definitely be especially concerned. Um, older people are just at greater risk of suicide, too, and I can't stress that enough. Um, we've all heard this before, but I'm going to say it again. Um, older white men, in particular, are at very high risk of suicide. Um, you can see um, from this uh, study from 2009 that, again, it's what we all reference, um, especially these uh, right through columns showing age groups of 75 and up and then 85 and up. Uh, these are the rates of suicide per 100,000, and those are quite high. Um, men already have a higher rate of completing suicide, so you can see in the younger groups, those are even higher than women already, and then as they get older, just significantly more so. Um, they are more likely to uh, choose lethal methods, uh, especially guns in particular. Um, so lesson for us all, uh, ask about suicide, it's very important. Screening, screening for it does not increase the risk of people doing it. Um, screening can save lives if, uh, if you're able to get that person hooked up with the right care. Um, this is particularly important for all of you because 39% of the people in this study um, had seen a primary care doctor in the last week, um, which, is, which is sad. So um, this is an opportunity for us to all, all act and screen. So a bit about uh, diagnosis, uh, depression screening is already recommended for all adults by the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, so we should be screening folks anyway. Um, older people in general are more likely to admit to depressive symptoms on self-rating scales, so I'd recommend using those with older people. You're just more likely to get a, an honest or accurate answer. Um, some of your options for scales I, I mentioned briefly last week. The geriatric depression scale is the best validated scale in, in older adults. Uh, I've mentioned before it hasn't been validated for use in those with moderate to severe dementia, so um, for your more cognitively intact folks, that's a great option. Um, the PHQ-9 um, is, is also uh, validated in older people, so you're welcome to use that as well. That's uh, more commonplace. This is the geriatric depression scale, just to get a feel for what, what it looks like. See, some of the questions are, um, they try to tailor them to uh, pick up on symptoms of depression that may not necessarily be confoundable with medical problems that are more common in older people. Um, so not asking as much about energy or appetite. Um, and uh, they ask more questions like, are you basically satisfied with your life? Um, uh, are you in good spirits most of the time? Um, they ask about the sort of cognitive aspect of things by saying, more problems with memory than most people. Is it wonderful to be alive t uh, today? So those give you, that gives you some idea of the type of questions um, that this asks. And then I mentioned also last week the Cornell scale for depression and dementia is the best validated for use in a uh, population with dementia. Um, and then I'd recommend screening for cognitive impairment uh, as part of your diagnostic workup um, because uh, cognitive symptoms can be so common also track to see if those improve with uh, improvements in their depression. 
and of course ensure they've had a recent physical exam, uh, basic labs, especially if you're going to be prescribing uh, medication. So treatment, I uh, want to say a word about psychotherapy because uh, it's often glossed over um, in general and then in older adults in particular because we think um, maybe they're less psychologically minded or more stigma around mental health, um, so just give them a pill. Um, we know this from research that older adults um, on average actually prefer psychotherapy um, to medication when offered. Um, so for mild and moderate depression in particular, um, I would offer psychotherapy um, if it's available to that person. These are three types of therapies that have been particularly uh, validated in older depressed people. Um, so there are definitely some good options that have been shown to be effective. Um, these can help them in managing with uh, life crises that come up in late life, developing coping skills, uh, and then also using kind of behavioral medicine techniques to help with compliance uh, in their biological treatments for depression and other medical conditions. As far as uh, pharmacological treatment goes, uh, changes in metabolism in late life, uh, of course, increase the risk of drug accumulation and toxicity, um, as is the case for all medications. Um, and then older adults are particularly sensitive, of course, to side effects in general, and then anticholinergic effects in particular, so a lot of the recommendations I make are around avoiding those. Uh, psychotropic drugs in particular are among the most common medications associated with preventable adverse drug events in the elderly, so the last thing we want to do is make people worse. Um, as with all drugs, avoid polypharmacy the best you can. Uh, start with lower doses than you would with younger people and escalate those doses more slowly. But do make sure you get to a, a therapeutic dose. Don't leave someone at 12.5 milligrams of sertraline for months and months. That probably won't help. Um, but do give them time to respond. We know that older adults can take up to 12 weeks to respond to an antidepressant. Um, so these are your classes of antidepressants. I'm not going to talk at all about ALIs because that's uh, rarely used for SSRIs are considered first line um, for treatment of depression in older adults because they're efficacious, they're easy to use, um, in general they're well tolerated and safe. Um, these are the examples of the ones that are on the market now um, and they have been shown to be effective in older adults. However, note that we don't really have any good evidence for use of these or any antidepressant to treat depression in the, in the setting of dementia. It doesn't mean we don't use it, but unfortunately there hasn't been Side effects, all the, uh, the same side effects you'd see in younger people, but a couple special notes. Um, older people are prone to a few things that you don't see in younger adults so often, including um, with SSRIs, which we generally consider quite safe, increased risk of bleeding um, because of the effects of serotonin directly on platelet activation, um, hyponatremia uh, due to SIADH, and this often occurs in the few, first few weeks of treatment, um, so it's something we can monitor for. Risk of falls and fractures. Um, and all antidepressants increase risk of falls. Um, most central anti medications do. And then there's some controversy around controversy around the effect that serotonin may have on bone metabolism, but that's that's still quite controversial. Um, and so these are a couple notes in particular with SSRIs. Uh, they're not all created equal. Fluoxetine or Prozac has a very very long half life due to an active um, and because of that, I try to avoid using it mostly in older people. It's more likely to accumulate. Uh, paroxetine, I try to avoid because it is moderately anticholinergic and not great for people that are prone to cognitive uh, impairment. Citalopram also has a black box warning from the FDA because of risk of QTC prolongation. Um, so 20 milligrams is the maximum dose recommended for older adults unless you're going to be monitoring EKGs. So that's another one that unless I know someone is likely going to respond to a low dose, I try to avoid um, leaving us really things like sertraline and escitalopram. It's not that I never use these, but um, these are trickier for those reasons. Um, in general, I'd start around at around half the minimal efficacious dose for younger adults and then double after one week. I recommend checking the sodium level one month after starting uh, to monitor for that risk of hyponatremia. Uh, 
SNRIs are the preferred alternative to SSRIs in general. Those are some examples of them. Um, and they can be effective not only for depression and anxiety, but for peripheral neuropathic pain, fibromyalgia, which is helpful in some older adults. Um, and uh, side effects, they can also cause hyponatremia on top of all the usual side effects that can occur in older adults. Um, these are <coughs> some other options for you, other second generation antidepressants. Propion or Wellbutrin is a very activating antidepressant that has some effect on dopamine, um, and it can be useful in older adults and is appropriate um, for use alone for depression as augmentation to another antidepressant um, or to alleviate sexual side effects of an antidepressant. Um, it's also approved for smoking cessation as well. Um, mirtazapine is another one we often see in older people and can be appropriate. It um, is helpful for depressed patients cluster of insomnia, poor appetite, um, and or those who just have difficulty tolerating the gastrointestinal or sexual side effects of other antidepressants. Um, tricyclics, um, I just want to say a word about these. These are fantastic antidepressants that are tricky to use in older people. Um, they're um, great for treatment of depression as well as those with insomnia and chronic pain, um, but you can see under adverse effects there, they have a lot of them. They're the beers criteria for a lot of different things. Um, so this is one where I would probably consider consulting specialty mental health if you're getting to this point for actual just treatment of depression. And then a word on antipsychotics because these are commonly used to augment an antidepressant or to treat uh, depression with psychotic features. I would say that um, I would advocate for um, using ECT over augmenting an antidepressant. If you've gotten to this point, augmenting with an antipsychotic, because we just have a myriad of adverse effects in older people, and ECT is generally safer, more effective um, for psychotic depression in particular. Um, and that's my plug for electroconvulsive therapy. If you have someone who's very depressed, older people respond really well, and it is safe. Um, and we even have a method of 